Hi and welcome to the video. I have been using the Nikon Z8 quite extensively lately for wildlife photography. I've shot more than 20,000 pictures with it and I realized how much you can configure in this camera. And I think that some settings are really important that you understand how to work and then modify them accordingly. So in this video I want to show you the most important settings that I changed on this camera and then also talk a bit about the button and dials customization that you can do. Of course here there is no right or wrong. Um, everybody has a bit of different style and that's why you can customize it. I just hope that I can give you some ideas or tips of how you could use some functions on some buttons to yeah, quickly change between different shooting modes in different situations. I just performed a factory reset on the Z8, so the settings that you see now will be the same as if you just get the camera new. And by the way, the settings are very similar for the Z9. So for wildlife, I like to control both my shutter speed and my f-stop. So for this, I'm first going to jump into the manual mode. If you prefer the aperture or shutter priority, um, yeah, feel free to do so. And another thing, I will change here the display settings quickly so that we can see all the settings. So the first thing I want to do is basically get kind of a base all-around setting for wildlife photography that if I go outside, I will still need to change some things, but hopefully as little as possible. So I will just dial in a reasonable shutter speed, let's say a 500th of a second, um, some ISO that are usually a bit higher, so I prefer to uh, manually put them, let's say, to 800 or 1000. So with the back dial I can change the value and with the front dial I can switch from auto ISO to the manual ISO. And of course, very important for wildlife photography, put the uh, camera in continuous shooting mode and I would recommend the continuous shooting high with 20 frames per second. And then we will go into the menu system. So here you can set a lot of things and I just want to cover the important ones. So first of all, the card selection, I would highly recommend that you use the CF Express card slot and not the SD just because it's much faster. However, if you also have an SD card lying around, Put it in there and just use it as an overflow, meaning if your CF Express card gets full or maybe you forgot it at home, it will switch over to the SD card. I would not necessarily recommend backup if you shoot a lot of wildlife with, with a lot of action and bursts because the SD card will just slow you down, meaning your buffer will be reached sooner. The image area I will keep to FX, so full frame, and I will also put an alert that if I should ever toggle into DX, even though I will prevent this at the later stage, it will warn me with the flashing DX symbol on the screen or in the viewfinder. Um, the image quality, I would highly recommend that you switch this to RAW. And then for the RAW recording, there is three different settings. There is a lossless compression, high efficiency star compression, and high efficiency. I chose the high efficiency star. I feel like the image quality is still very good. File size, I think, was between 30 and 40 megabytes. And one of the main reasons for me to choose the high efficiency star is, well, first of all, it saves a bit of storage, but second, the buffer will be bigger so you can shoot for longer. So here you have the ISO sensitivity settings. As I said, I'm in manual, but if I would switch to auto, you can set a few more things. For example, the maximum sensitivity. Personally, I think this is a misunderstood point. Some people think I will put this to 3200 so that I get better, better image quality and the camera is not pushing the ISO too much. But let's say you're in manual mode with auto ISO, it's not the camera that is pushing the ISO too high. It's you that set a specific shutter speed and um, aperture and the camera is just trying to get a properly exposed image. So yeah. I would not put this too low. I saw some people putting it to 3200 ISO and then in manual mode with automatic ISO they got underexposed images which is not better than a properly exposed image taken at higher ISO. Anyway, you can set the minimum shutter speed here. First of all, you can set a fixed value or you can set automatic but define a bit more if you want to have uh, it on zero which is usually more or less one divided by the focal length, or if you say, ah, I have very steady hands and a good stabilizer, so I go to minus two, or no, I don't have a stabilizer in my lens, I go to a faster speed. 
However, keep in mind this only helps for a camera shake, not if you have motion blur because your subject moves. And this is also the reason why I recommend not to use um, aperture priority with auto ISO. And this minimum shutter speed setting is only relevant there. Anyway, I'm turning the auto ISO off again for me now. The white balance, I prefer to just set it to most of the time direct sunlight. You can change this in RAW afterwards anyway, but I prefer if I have a burst or a series of pictures if they all have the same white balance. And with auto it can happen that if the subject moves a bit, is behind a different, uh, in front of a different background, the white balance changes. This makes it a bit harder in the editing for me. So many things here I will just skip because they are not relevant in RAW. And I would recommend that you put the high ISO noise reduction off um, this is again is only affecting the JPEG and I've seen in some cameras that it slows the camera down. I'm not 100% sure if this is happening with the say 8, 8 or not, but again it's not really helping. Um, the vignette control I will also put off and all these other things that could potentially slow the camera down. All these flicker modes are not important if we shoot outdoor. And now it gets more interesting. The focus mode, I would obviously put to continuous autofocus, AFC, so that the camera is always readjusting the focus. The AF area, I always set depending on the scene, but as a standard, I usually choose the um, wide AF area C2, and here I can actually customize this even more. So for the wide area C2, I decided to go for a really big one, so something like this. The wide area C1, I chose to have it a bit smaller, something like this. So usually I start with C2, so I will keep it here. Um, AF subject detection options, you can put this on auto if you shoot sometimes people, sometimes animals, sometimes vehicles. If you always shoot animals, I would kind of recommend to just put it to animals from the start. I think it's just faster and more reliable. I will put the VR on, but I will put it to normal mode and not to sports mode. This corresponds to the mode 1 that you have on Canon and Sigma and I think Tamron and many other manufacturers. Okay, that was it here. For video, I will skip this for now because the Z8 and the Z9 are extremely capable video cameras. I think uh, maybe the best hybrid cameras on the market right now. So that's a whole topic for itself. If you're interested in this, let me know in the comments and I will make a setup guide just for video. But for now, let's go to the custom settings menu. So first of all, you have different custom setting banks. You saw maybe in the beginning, you also had uh, shooting banks in the first menu. So in each bank, you can store all the custom settings with specific parameters. And this could be interesting, I think, if you shoot completely different subjects, for example, landscapes and animals. Or if you want to shoot maybe birds and sports photography or whatever. And the kind of the settings vary a lot. Or I think it can also be important or interesting if you share the camera with somebody else, like your partner. For me, I will usually always keep the A and then just make small adjustments in one or two of the settings, depending on the scene. That being said, let's start with the focus one, I think the most important. First, there is the AFC priority selection. So this basically um, determines if you are tracking a bird in flight or anything that moves. Do you want that the camera just continues to shoot with 20 frames per second, even though it has no focus confirmation? Or do you want that, that the camera waits with like taking the picture until it has a confirmation of focus? So I think both have ups and downs. If for you, capturing the moment is more important than a sharp picture, go for release. If you say you don't want to go through too many blurry pictures, then put it to focus. But be aware that maybe you will miss some pictures that are ever so slightly out of focus or the camera just didn't get a confirmation, even though the bird was actually sharp. So I go for a middle thing here and put focus to and release. I didn't have the impression that the camera was slowed down much in this way. For AFS, I'm not using this for birds, but if I do a, would do a landscape shot or something, I would highly recommend this is on focus because they usually just take one or two pictures. So you want that they are really sharp and you can usually wait more. Focus tracking with log on. Here you, with the first parameter, you can basically say if let's say you lose your subject for a second, it goes out of the focus area that you have selected or another subject is entering in this focus area. What should the camera do? 
Should it stay with the original subject and ignore the new subject? Or should it switch to the new subject? I want to illustrate this with this video. So we have a bird flying, he's passing behind a tree. And as you can see, the camera sticks with the bird and is not jumping to the tree. To achieve this, we need to change this blocked shot AF response to a value more to the right. So a more delayed response. And here I put four, I made quite a good experiences with this. The second thing is the subject motion. Is it a static or erratic motion? Here it's important to know it's not about the speed of the subject. So it's not like ah, I have a fast flying bird. Even a flying bird can be very steady if it just flies in a constant speed through the picture. Erratic would be if it changes the direction very quickly or if it's starting or stopping. So the change of speed. Um, and Usually I keep it on steady. I make quite good experiences. I think this is the best setting for just normal flying birds. For starting or landing birds, maybe I would put it erratic depending on the size of the bird. But even there, I took pictures of some stills that were starting. And as you can see in the clip, the camera was still tracking it perfectly, even though I had it on the steady one. But this is definitely a setting I would change from time to time. With the focus points used, you can decide if you want to be able to select all the focus points or just every second of the focus point. With the second setting, it feels more like a DSLR, I would say. So the, the other focus point selection jumps a bit. With the first one, it's more continuous. I keep it on all points. I'm still fast enough with this and I prefer this smooth movement. However, it's important to note, even if you put alternating points, the camera is still using all of the AF points uh, in subject detection and subject tracking. It's just the selective, the points that are selectable by you. Store points by orientation is a very cool setting, I think. And I will try to give you an example. So if you look at me, my head is uh, in the center of the image on the top, so top center. Um, so you have the autofocus point here. Now, if you would switch the camera into the vertical shooting position, the autofocus point would be on the left of the image or on the right, depending on which direction you move the camera. So not on my head anymore. And with store points by orientation, I can specify that it should, that I have a different autofocus point for vertical and for horizontal position. So I put this for autofocus point. You could even say that you want to have different areas, but usually I want to kind of keep the same area. So either a single point or a larger area, but the position of this area or point should be different for vertical and horizontal. AF activation, I have this on shutter and AF on. If you prefer a back button autofocus, you need to put this on AF on only. However, I'm still kind of using a back button autofocus, but not exclusively. I will show you this in a minute. The focus point persistence, I keep it on auto. And this basically says if you are in a large zone and you have an autofocus point and then you switch to 3D tracking, should it pick up where you left with the large zone, if this makes sense. And for me, yes, I usually want to have this. The next option lets me limit the autofocus area mode. And I actually limit this a bit that I can toggle faster between the remaining ones. So on the set eight, I found that the single point AF is actually quite a small area. So I actually didn't need the pinpoint AF so far. So I deactivated this. I'm actually deactivating the dynamic AF areas. I personally have not used them for my type of shooting, but this depend might depend on your subjects, your style and your lens. And I also deactivated the wide a a area AFL. So I have remaining the wide area AFS, C1, C2. The 3D tracking I'm also deactivating because I will afterwards assign this to a specific function button. With focus mode restriction, um, you can actually say that it should only stay in continuous autofocus and you cannot accidentally switch to AFS. I actually did this for me because I'm only shooting wildlife with this lens. The focus point wraparound lets you, basically, if you move the autofocus point to one edge of the frame and you go further, should it reappear on the other side or not, I put this to off. Uh, focus point display, I put that it should switch to green if the um, subject is in uh, focus in AFC. This just helps me a bit to better understand if the camera actually grabbed the subject and thinks it's, it's in focus or not. And you can change the color of the 3D tracking. I change this depending on the, on, the, on the subject. So in backlit, I found that red is not necessarily the best option. 
Um, so I usually kept it in white. I found this worked quite fine for me, but depends on your background and subject. With the focus point selection speed, you can decide how quickly you can move around the focus uh, point with a joystick. For me, normal was quite fine. And with manual focus ring in AF mode, you can this if you have this on, you can always uh, kind of grab the manual focus ring and yeah, change the focus manually. I found this very useful if the camera was stuck on the background. Just be aware if you're on a beanbag, this could also mean that you can accidentally move the focus without wanting to. Okay, this was autofocus, this was a big topic, the exposure should be a bit quicker. I will leave many things here on standard. Um, one thing I will change is keep exposure when f-stop changes. This is quite useful if you have a variable um, f-stop lens, where let's say you start at 200 millimeter with f, I don't know, 5, and at 600 millimeter you have f6.3, so this means you lose some light if you zoom in, and then the camera will automatically increase either shutter speed or ISO, uh, decrease shutter speed, sorry, or increase the ISO. And here I would recommend to go with the ISO because usually you put the shutter speed where it is for a reason. Um, so I put this to ISO. Also quite handy with the 600 millimeter f4 here. If I switch in the extender, I lose one stop of light. So the camera increases the ISO by one stop. I will skip the next two options. The power off delay, I usually just increase it a bit because it annoys me if the camera goes off too quickly. However, this might cause your battery to drain a bit quicker, so be aware of this. The continuous shooting speed, I have the high speed still at 20 frames per second, the low at 5, but I'm usually always at 20. You could limit the maximum shots per burst, so that if you accidentally press the button, I don't know, somehow in your camera bag, this never happened to me. It happened to me once or twice in the field that I was somehow touching it without realizing and the camera shoots pictures. You could limit this, but the maximum limit is 200. And if you have fighting birds, 200 frames, it's two, 10 seconds. I think I already had one or two occasions where I shot more than this, and then it's super annoying if the camera stops shooting. You also have the pre-release capture options so that the camera already takes pictures before you fully press the shutter. However, with Nikon cameras, this only works in JPEG mode, so I have not used it so far. You can set, limit the selectable image area. I actually did this so that I only have FX um, and no crop mode because I prefer to crop on the computer if I do so. so it gives me more flexibility. Um, I will skip a lot here. You can customize your viewfinder or shooting display, but I will also skip this. I put the high FPS viewfinder display on. Again, might drain the battery a bit faster, but I think it just helps if you want to um, kind of uh, yeah, follow your subject very quickly. The flash is not really important for me. And here the custom shooting control, so the button layout. This is a very big one. So here it's really there's no right or wrong. It's just these settings work quite well for me. You need to figure out if they work for you as well or not. So on the FN1 button, for me I put the star light need to find it. So this basically simulates an optical viewfinder. Um, and this can be very useful in backlit situation or when you want to shoot some low key. So in every situation where you have an underexposed image and you don't see it very well, the camera might have trouble focusing, you can put the starlight, you have a brighter image. Just keep in mind that what you see is not what you will get. So usually I set the exposure in the normal view then I switch to starlight and then from time to time I switch back to the normal one just to quickly see if the exposure is still fine. If we go one to the right, there is the FN2 button. I use this to switch to a, like a saved shooting mode. So usually I uh, shoot, I have a specific settings. Let's say I'm shooting stationary birds with one five hundredth of a second and I see a bird is taking off. Here I can preset a fo um, shooting function that is targeted specifically for uh, flying birds. It could also be for panning shots or whatever. I will just show you quickly here for flying birds. I will go put it to manual. Oh, and I need to specify with a tick if I want to override this setting or keep the one I have. So shutter speed, I want to override. I want to go to 2,500 of a second. This is adequate for a bit larger birds for 
some swifts or swallows, I would go to something more like a 3200 or 4000 of a second. It should keep the aperture that I have. Exposure compensation, I, I just put to zero here. I might need to adjust this depending on the scene. Uh, the ISO sensitivity is very important that here I go to automatic ISO because yeah, this is a scene where I quickly want to change so I don't have time to set the ISO manually. Uh, the white balance can stay as it was before. The autofocus area should also stay. The subject detection, this can all stay. And just to be sure, I want I put it to uh, the high release mode here. And with menu, I can go back and confirm the settings. For the AF on button, I put uh, AF area mode and AF on. And here I put the 3D tracking. So as I said before, usually I'm in wide area AF C2. This is the bigger frame. It might detect the bird in there. And as soon as it detects it, I can switch to 3D tracking and then the camera will track the subject even if it moves outside of this frame. Um, here, this is for the battery grip. So I skip this because I don't have one. If you have a battery grip, I would just recommend using the same settings that you have on the buttons in the horizontal position. The FN3 is one that is a bit hard to reach. So I don't put something important here because usually my left hand is at the lens. What I put here was to um, change the uh, shutter speed and f-stops in full values. This just makes it a bit quicker to quickly adjust something, but I have not used it much. I left the display button as it is. The OK I put to none. You could also preset the focus point that it uh, sh shifts to a specific preset point. I have not needed this yet, but if you can use it, cool. The joystick, I want that it um, goes back to the center of the focus. Um, select center focus point. And again, for the battery grip, I would also put it to the same. I keep the exposure um, compensation. And here the movie uh, function, I actually reprogrammed that with this, I can change the autofocus area. The ISO I keep and here the command dials, um, I switch them around because I'm coming from Canon. Um, this makes it a bit yeah, easier for me. But if you already are used to the way Nikons work, probably you don't want to change this. Um, the lens FN2 function, so this is the front one, I put this to select a single point autofocus, but not activating the autofocus, but just selecting it, then I can move it with the joystick and then activate it with the shutter button. I don't use a single autofocus that much anymore, but sometimes it can be useful if the subject detection is not working. The other lens FN, uh, I have actually not used it because I find it a bit harder to reach. So you could also turn it off at the moment, it's at AF lock. And then here the uh, function ring of the 600 millimeter. I actually have that I turn it to the right. I can save the focus position and to the left I can recall it. This can be very useful again if you take pictures of flying birds and the camera const uh, constantly goes to the background. You can easily with one turn of the wheel bring it back to a specific, specific distance. On some lenses I also like to use the uh, specific memory set button, but I find on the 600 millimeter it's a bit far away. So I prefer, since I have this big wheel, to use the function wheel. The control ring, uh, actually I turned this off. I don't like the implementation so much on Nikon cameras, to be honest, because there is no click. For Canon you have like some steps that click. For Nikon it's more continuous, which might be nice for focusing, but I find it a bit harder to put a ISO or exposure compensation. I think that's it. Uh, again, no right or wrong, whatever works for you. We have the same options for the playback here. I don't want to go through it because it takes a lot of time and I think it's not so relevant anymore. Just a few words. For example, on the FN1, I put that it uh, gives a rating to the image. On the FN2, I put that it shows the histogram. I think on the rec button, I put that it's the filtered view. So it only jumps from images with that have at least one star. And I put, for example, the front dial that it jumps by 30 images so that I can navigate through them quicker. Again, up, totally up to you and it's playback, so it is not so important. 
The reverse ring for focus I put on because again I'm coming from Canon and for Canon they focus the other way around so this is just I'm more used to this. Um, it's muscle memory and you can do it the other, same way uh, the other way around actually if you come from Nikon you want to switch to Canon. Canon also has this function. Otherwise I think I'm not really changing much here anymore. I will skip the video part as I said so also, also skipping the playback part here. Um, I'm going now to the uh, to this wrench menu. So here I'm changing only a few things. With the save focus position you can say that if you turn off the camera it should save the focus position it had before. Let's say it was on 25 meters. If you turn it on again it's again at 25 meters. I think it's not super important but it can be handy and can be quicker. Um, the sensor shield behavior power off I would really Put this at the shield closes for dust protection and then the camera sounds I prefer if it's not doing a, a artificial shutter sound but otherwise there is not much more to change one very important setting is the slot empty release lock so make sure that this is on lock otherwise if you don't have a SD or CF Express card in the camera the camera will still take pictures and afterwards if you hit the play button obviously you will not see any because none were recorded. What you can do now if you're happy with your setting is save them to the memory card and then you can uh, like easily retrieve them again or sync them to your other set 8.